Joe, I am excited to have you on my show, brother. Welcome. Guys, I've known our guest today, Joe Polish, for almost 30 years. He's incredibly networked and is a thought leader. You've been featured on Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Fortune, U.S. News, and World Report. You have helped to generate literally hundreds of millions of dollars for your clients. You started your first business in 1990 as a humble carpet cleaner and look at you now. My story is dead broke carpet cleaner, living off credit cards, did that for a couple of years. I mean, I truly hated it. Not only disliked it, I hated it. And this rich guy's friend were out on the jet skis and I'm just talking to this guy and I'm wondering if you have any advice. He said, well, if there's nothing wrong with the business you're in, there's something wrong with you. And I was like, well, shit, that's not the motivational speech I wanted to hear. <laughs> and so what I, what I did though, what that conversation did for me is Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Brought to you by Lean Body, the number one protein shake in gyms across America. Welcome back to the Lee Labrada Show, where our mission is to help you improve your physical, mental, and spiritual strength. My show is growing fast and becoming very popular thanks to you. So if you're enjoying the content, would you please hit the like button below now and forward the show to one person? That's how we continue to grow, and that's how I can keep bringing you content that you can grow with. On today's show, we're going to be talking with one of the most influential people that I know. He's incredibly networked and is a thought leader among some of the top motivational speakers and authors in the world. People like the world-renowned Tony Robbins regularly appear at his conferences. Guys, I've known our guest today, Joe Polish, for almost 30 years. We met back when we were working alongside legendary fitness entrepreneur Bill Phillips, author of Body for Life and founder of EAS Sports Supplements. Joe, I am excited to have you on my show, brother. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Great to be here, and it's been a long time, and so I'm glad we're finally uh, having, a, having a conversation on your podcast. Yeah, it's so cool. Joe, listen, you have helped to build thousands of businesses and generated literally hundreds of millions of dollars for your clients. You've been featured on uh, Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Fortune, U.S. News, and World Report. You've even spoken at Stanford University. I mean, how many people do that? So I want to spend a little time today exploring your ideas on building successful businesses. But first, we want to hear your story. You started your first business in 1990 as a humble carpet cleaner. And look at you now, you've learned, uh, you had to learn marketing in order to survive. Uh, yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, here's the funny thing. I could talk for a long time and I can get uh, sort of long-winded and whatnot if I if I ramble through my uh, upbringings. My, probably my first entrepreneurial ventures were uh, being a drug dealer when I was a drug addict. Oh my gosh. That's how I actually supported my addiction. So I spend at this stage of my life, I spend uh, half my time helping entrepreneurs and the other half helping people that struggle with addiction because I have an addiction uh, recovery foundation called uh, Genius Recovery. So uh, my story has a lot to do with being disconnected growing up and in my adult life, learning how to connect with uh, others. Uh, but I couldn't do that until I learned how to connect with myself. And that took a long time and uh, I would go in and out of it. So uh, my first entrepreneurial venture, like you mentioned, I was a carpet cleaner. So I, I've lived in Arizona most of my adult life. I went to New Mexico State University for a couple of years. I tell people to go to college, but really it was to go to college, but also to remove myself from the environment and all of the relationships that my addiction was embedded in. And so I, I don't know how many people that are li listening to us have ever struggled with an addiction or have a family member uh, that has struggled with an addiction, but your whole life revolves around that sort of behavior and that compulsivity. And so uh, I never got a degree in anything. Uh, I went to Chandler Gilbert Community College, which is a small uh, you know, college here in, in Arizona uh, around the time I was trying to you know, figure out how to make my business work. And I failed owning and operating a small business. And I got a C minus in principles of marketing. And I've written five books now, but one of them, I, I reprint my report card in there so people could see that I really don't have any formal college education. And speaking at Stanford is funny because I could never have qualified to go to Stanford. But I, you know, I had spoken to BJ Fogg, who's the behavioral, um, you know, researcher. And one of his students actually created an Instagram, which is cool. He's a, he's an amazing guy. He wrote a book called Tiny Habits. But anyway, so my story is dead broke carpet cleaner, living off credit cards. Did that for a couple of years uh, from 1990 to 1992. 
uh, I had gone deeply in debt and I just wanted to figure out how to make a business work. I couldn't work for anyone else or but I tried, but I was no good at it. And I was really no good at running a business or figuring out how to generate business. But I came across um, a newsletter written by a guy named Gary Halbert, which is funny. You mentioned uh, Bill Phillips. That was the link between me and Bill Phillips, which started our first conversation. And going back to 1995, uh, he was doing a event in the Bali Hotel uh, for a bunch of bodybuilders. And I had walked up to him and I said, have you ever heard of Gary Halbert? And he's like, yeah, you know, Gary Halbert? I go, yeah. And he's like, do you write copy as in sales copy? And I said, well, you know, I, I do, but I often hire copywriters. He's like, I can't find anyone that writes really great copy, which of course was a lie because Bill Phillips had lots of copywriters that wrote for him and he wrote copy himself. Uh, but that's how, that's what started the conversation. And so, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but nonetheless, I had this carpet cleaning business. I was struggling. I was trying to figure out what other business I could go into that would allow me to make better money. Cause I was, this was just not working. I hated my life. I was doing hard manual labor. Uh, and I, I tell people now, you know, there's many ways to go broke. Uh, one of the dumbest ways to go broke is doing hard manual labor, uh, 8, 10, 12, 14, sometimes 16 hour days, sweating your ass off and paying money to do that. I mean, back then there was no internet. So you could, you know, sit on the couch and watch TV and, you know, that would be a way more intelligent way to go broke. But one of the dumbest ways to go broke is to finance, you know, a business that is not working, going deeper into debt, refusing to get a job and still trying to stick with it. You know, it's that quote everyone's heard a million times, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, which is actually an Einstein quote. Um, so that's kind of the trap that I was in. And I didn't know what the hell to do. I didn't know how to get out of it. And I, I didn't have any of the tools and the ways to think about it that obviously I learned. So I'm glad that I went through that stuff. And I, I now look at every difficult situation that comes to all of us, like everyone that is listening to us. Uh, they, if you look back at your life, the things that you probably had, the, the dominoes, I like to refer to them as dominoes, the things that, that changed the trajectory of your life mostly came out of not inspiration. They came out of desperation. They came out of adversity. They came out of difficulty. And so, you know, pain is a messenger. It is life's way of saying, notice, pay attention, wake up. And so I was in a lot of mental pain, a lot of physical pain. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And in that state, you can often be receptive or you can be trying to escape it. And so I was not enjoying my life at all. It was really difficult. And I thought there was an answer in another business. There was something else I needed to be doing because clearly I sucked at this particular business. So there was one, and, and by the way, if you if if you need to interject at any point in time, just please interrupt me. I'll, I'm just gonna. I'll no, you're. Hey, me. listen, you're 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 doing great. You're doing great. I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to yellow highlight one part that you brought up, which is that um, it's not inspiration that leads us to change. Uh, a lot of times, it's you know, it's the challenges. You know, and uh, it's it's been the same. Uh, you know, for every every bodybuilder. You know, uh, and you and I know quite a few of them. You know, uh, you go into the gym, you lift weights, you know, that's painful, you know, if you do it right. And then obviously uh, you have the adaptation that comes from that, you know, so you have to have a challenge if you're going to grow in anything, whether it's in a, a gym or whether it's in your life or in a business. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, your whole life and all the people that you, you just an example, everyone you've trained, your son, I mean, everyone has to exert effort in order to build. And muscles are a byproduct of resistance and working through the resistance, feeding the resistance uh, in a particular way. Stress allows you to grow. Distress will actually break you down. So there's a point where the stress is beyond growth. It's not expanding you, it's contracting you. So that's, that's a bit of a you know, awareness. And it's also, you know, sometimes it's just not being stupid. It's just being intelligent and determining what to follow. And we're all stupid in some ways, and we're all intelligent in some ways. It's just learning what is on <laughs> kryptonite, what are the skills and capabilities we need to learn. And I'll tell you, for me, I'm always trying to learn stuff. You know, I don't think anyone's listening to this if they're not trying to learn something. Um, even in, in, in addiction recovery, I, I, I learned that for me, unlearning 
is as important and in, in many cases more important than learning because we have to unlearn a lot of the stuff that we think is right, that we think works, that we think we're so convinced is a path. And if you stop and say, is it producing a result? Is it making my life work? It's not. And you need to unlearn. Some people can refer to that as habits. Other people can refer to it as conditioning. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of uh, preconceived notions that were just completely wrong about business and about many parts of life. So um, I was in this business struggling. And I had a friend that I went to high school with uh, named Pat that called me up one uh, one weekday and he said, Hey, this weekend, uh, I'm going to go to uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Saguaro Lake, which is a kind of a lake out here in Arizona where people water ski and do all kinds of stuff, go out on boats. And he said, I I've got, uh, you know, I'm going to go out for the, the weekend with a friend who has a, you know, a couple of jet skis. Would you like to go? And I said, well, you know, I'm busier than hell. I got so much work to do on, on the weekend. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I was kind of in a state, state of shame. I didn't want to say I'm broke. I have no money. Um, I'm just trying to survive here. Uh, and he, he mentioned to me, he said, well, the guy that owns the, I, I made an excuse that I, I'm busy. I can't go, which I thought to be true. Uh, and he said, well, you know, I've, I've, the guy that owns the jet ski is a multi-million dollar real estate investor. He's a pretty smart guy. And that immediately piqued my interest. Like, oh, some successful person, maybe I can go you know, hang out with this person and get some advice on what the hell to do. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll be there. So I drove out to Saguaro Lake in my, you know, beat up pickup truck. And this guy had can't even remember his name. I wish I would have, because this ended up becoming one of the most instrumental conversations that changed the whole trajectory of my business life. Uh, this guy was there and he had another friend and my friend Pat, there were two jet skis. And so I finally had a chance to sit on the tailgate of you know, his pickup truck and my friend Pat and this rich guy's friend were out on the jet skis and I'm just talking to this guy. And I said, so I hear you do, you know, really well in, in business. And I'm wondering if you have any advice uh, into a business that you would suggest getting into, because I have a small carpet cleaning business, but I'd like to go into another business uh, where I can maybe do better. And he said to me, he goes, well, is there anyone doing well in your business? And I said, well, yeah, you know, there's a couple of companies in the Phoenix area, which is where I live. Uh, and was living at the time, uh, I said, there's a couple of companies, that, you know, in Phoenix that make over a million dollars a year. And back then, you know, early nineties, that was a, a lot of money. And he said, well, if there's other people in this business doing well that you're in and you're not, there's nothing wrong with the business you're in. There's something wrong with you. And I was like, well, shit, that's not the motivational speech I wanted to hear. <laughs> so, uh, he, I, I said to him, you know, immediately, because I had to defend, you know, my, of course, belief system here, you know, and a belief means you're just not sure, you know, people often has, have these beliefs that they're so convinced are true. And I said, well, you know, I'm certified, I've gotten trained, uh, I've been at this for, you know, a couple of years, uh, I do a good job, I don't do any bait and switch advertising, just going through a whole list of things that I felt you know, I was doing right and it was still difficult. And I said, you know, uh, a lot of these companies are established. I'm relatively new at it. I've not been doing it that long. And, uh, and he said, well, he goes, you're like most people, young man. He goes, you think the grass is always greener on the other side. And he said, if you want to go into another business, uh, you're going to spend the next year, another two years to learn the technical skills of another, you know, business, you can go out and repeat the same bad business habits that cause you to be a failure in the one that you're currently in. And I was like, well, you know, damn. So he was not going to let me off the hook. He wasn't being a jerk about it, but he was just being very matter of fact. And I had, at that stage in my life, you know, early twenties, I had never really had anyone talk to me like that. Uh, not saying anything I wanted to hear, but saying it in a way to where I knew it to be true. And he said, if there's other people doing well in your business, you're not, the problem is not you. It's the business that, you know, the problem, the problem is not, it's not the business, it's you. And he said, what you need to do is you need to learn fundamental business skills. And if you can learn how to make a business work, then you can apply those skills to any business. And, you know, so it's not about going into another business. It's figuring out what you don't know. Why is it working for other people? And it's not working for you. And so what happened is I, you know, remember I was super sunburned that day. And so I drove home and I like a massive sunburn on my shoulders and I was driving and I thought to myself, you know, I live in America and uh, it's a free country. 
you know, unfortunately, where we're living now, there's many forces, as you know, trying to remove that freedom. And there's a lot of assholes that are running around in leadership positions uh, worldwide. However, you know, it's like I live in America. I love this country. I have a lot of personal Amen. problems. I'm, Amen. I'm stressed. I have a lot of anxiety. You know, I, I just, you know, a couple years prior, you know, just getting sober from being a drug addict. And I had a lot of challenges, but I'm like, I'm a hard worker. I, I want to do well. I don't take it, you know, I don't take advantage of people. I care about my customers. I care about my clients. I have work ethic. Um, if other people are doing well and I'm not, they obviously know something that I don't. So I made a pact with myself that I would not get out of that business that I hated. I mean, I truly hated it. Not only disliked it, I hated it. Uh, I wanted it to work, but I hated all of the effort in seeing other people doing well that seemed to care less, that not treat people well. Some that were doing bait and switch advertising, which I was doing none of that. And they're making a shit ton of money. And I'm like, it makes you question integrity. It makes you question morality. When you try to do good work in the world, when you try to be a giver and you see other people that are just taking advantage and they do really well. So I, I had all that, this stuff going on in my head. What I, what I did though, what that conversation did for me is I made a decision that I'm not going to get out of this business until I figure out how to make it work. So all of a sudden a business I hated became an experiment. It became a obstacle that I needed to overcome. It need that I needed to figure out how to dance with and I needed to figure out how to say, okay, this is presented to me for me to navigate and figure this out. So I uh, ch totally changed my mindset and said, okay, you know, this is my experiment. I'm going to figure out how to make this business work and I'm going to learn everything I can on how to make the create a successful business. So I started down the path I was already reading, but I wasn't reading the right things. I, you know, what I needed to figure out how to solve was how to make a business work and how to market it. I, at the time, I didn't even understand what marketing was. I heard the word and I thought that was branding and I thought it was your logo and I thought it was, you know, all kind of advertising, but I didn't know how to write advertising that worked. I, I, I didn't, you know, my, my latest book, What's in it for them? Uh, most of the advertising that almost everyone does is they talk about themselves. They don't talk about, you know, what a product or service is or what it does for the person is the benefit. You know, what it is, is like the feature. And I didn't know the difference between feature and benefits. I didn't know what a unique selling proposition was. I didn't know anything about that. So uh, I luckily had a friend give me a newsletter written by a guy named Gary Halbert, who I, you know, that's the link I had with Bill Phillips who wrote, he was, a, he was a direct response copywriter who would write, you know, really powerful, compelling uh, headlines. And so I started studying direct marketing and I uh, applied it. And what I learned is that selling is what you do when you're on the phone or face to face with somebody. Marketing is what you do to get someone on the phone or face to face with you properly positioned. So by the time they're talking to you or your team or visiting your website, you know, even though there were no websites back then, they're, you know, they're properly positioned. So they're pre-interested, pre-motivated, pre-qualified and predisposed to do business with you. So I didn't know how to position myself. And almost all marketing is about positioning and it's unique packaging, bundling and unbundling. It's not just what you say, but it's it's how you say it. And so I was in a business selling something that nobody wants to buy. And I had to figure out how to successfully sell something that no one looks at for to buy. You know, people go buy food, they go buy clothes, they go buy concerts, they buy fun things, things they want. Some things need to be sold. N nobody's like, you know, I really hope to wake up this morning and the dog or the cat pees in the carpet and I have to call a carpet cleaner or, you know, my spouse spills coffee and, for, you know, we have to come. No one, these are, it's an accidental industry. People hire a carpet cleaner either because of an event or some accident that happened uh, or they just get, you know, fed up with their dirty carpet. So I, I was like, okay, how do I make this work? And so I always say to people, if you are in the business, in any sort of career selling anything that is more sexy and exciting than carpet cleaning, you could probably learn <laughs> from the methodologies because I applied the same damn thing to Bill Phillips. Uh, and I gave him the idea to donate money to the make a wish foundation, uh, through a movie he made called body of work years ago. You remember, all I that? remember that yeah. he, he became the single largest individual contributor in the history of the world for, uh, 
the carpet cleaning industry. I gave him the idea, which became the Evolution Man with Clark Bartram, which was probably at the time the most viewed, most advertised uh, fitness ad of all time. I, you know, gave him all kinds of models using education-based marketing and free recorded messages, but that all started with uh, carpet cleaning. And my first sales letter was a consumer's guide to carpet cleaning. Read this guide and discover. I'll say this and then I'll shut up and we'll go. Uh, so <laughs> my first sales letter was a consumer's guide to carpet cleaning. Cause what I learned is it's not what people know. It's what people don't know that they don't know that if you put it in front of them, they'll be like, Oh, it makes them rethink about things other than price. Because to make marketing simple for people, uh, anything that you put in front of somebody is marketing. Anyone that's married at some point was doing marketing. Anyone that has gotten anything, everything that I say, you say, anyone says is either designed to attract or repel. Some forms of marketing are designed to repel people because you don't want everyone interested. I mean, you want a particular segment. There's only a small percentage of people that want to be, you know, want to be bodybuilders, let alone professional bodybuilders, tiny, tiny niche. So, you know, you speak to the person that you want to speak to and you repel, not in an offensive way. And I wouldn't, you know, front stage say, let's create ads that repel people. It's more about let's create advertising that attracts who we want and not everybody. And so, uh, when you're very niche specific, so I wanted people that were not interested in lowest price. So I, you know, I ran an ad that said, um, you know, call and request this consumer's guide to carpet cleaning, uh, read this guide and discover seven questions to ask a carpet cleaner before you invite them into your home. So people didn't know there were seven questions to ask. If you're a real estate agent, seven questions or six questions or five questions or 12 questions to ask an interior designer, a graphic designer, a health coach, a personal trainer, doesn't matter, but just carpet cleaning was what I was uh, writing about. So it was uh, seven questions to ask a carpet cleaner before you invite them into your home, six mistakes or eight mistakes to avoid when choosing a carpet cleaner, six costly misconceptions about carpet cleaning, crawling critters and crud, a guide to the slime, grime and livestock that's seeping, creeping and galloping through your carpet, <laughs> how to avoid four carpet cleaning you ripoffs. You still haven't memorized, have memorized, Joe. Oh yeah, no, it's all through memory. Uh, and, it, and, you know, and then they would open it up and it said, dear homeowner, choosing a carpet cleaner isn't easy. Why? Because you're bombarded with com uh, uh, confusing claims, simply bad information, near worthless methods, unqualified technicians. How do you ever find a qualified, competent carpet cleaner? You start by reading this guide. Now with this information, you can make an informed, intelligent decision. And that's what it boils down to. People don't want to make an idiotic, uninformed decision. The number one question in everyone's mind is, who can I trust? So your job as a business owner or anyone trying to build rapport is to establish trust and rapport. You know, rapport is trust with comfort. People don't just trust you. They feel comfortable with you. So you can build rapport very quickly. Trust, real trust takes a little time. And that's why I wrote a whole book about this stuff, because it's not just like, hey, let me just write an ad. Let me do this. Let me, you know, be smooth talking. And all of a sudden people are going to trust me. People are very much afraid of being taken advantage of. People are scared. Uh, and they, they may be real tough guys too. Um, but everyone has, has particular fears. They want to feel safety. And so our job is, as humans is to, you know, really connect with people and you can do that in advance. That's what marketing does. Marketing done well makes selling easy and ideally unnecessary. Uh, however, selling is really important because we're always selling. Like if in, in your life, Lee, if you have, you've probably had many relationships, uh, men and women, uh, that were getting involved with another person. You knew that person was destructive. You knew that person was bad news. You probably, depending on the, the, the person, wanted to guide and direct the person you care about to not go into a quicksand trap, not to get involved with something or someone. It could be a business. It could be a personal relationship that was, in your opinion or your experience, not good news. And if you are ever in a situation where someone's going down a path, could be your own kids, right? Who would you become as a person? What would you do? You would listen to them. You would ask questions. You would challenge them. You would encourage them. Uh, same thing with you. If you're trying to sell someone through a hard workout, you know, they're tired, they're exhausted. You're doing a sales job. Come on. Every time you spot somebody, you're doing a freaking sales job. 
And you're, you know, so who do you become when you care about someone? You, you become compassionate, you become empathetic, you become challenging. The best of who we are shows up when we're selling in a good way. If you're selling in a bad way, where you're trying to talk someone into something they don't want, something that isn't good for them, that never feels good. It's manipulative. And so, you know, I'm talking about using marketing and selling from your higher self, because there's a lot of scumbag marketers out there. There's a lot of bullshit. There's tons of propaganda that's being used. I mean, you can look at the news of any mainstream media and you can see marketing being done in the most manipulative, destructive, dangerous ways. But uh, then you I, look would, at people- I would agree with that. And, um, and, and I think people can see that uh, a mile away. You know, it, they're, they just, um, you know, uh, it makes them it makes them leery. Uh, Joe, you know, uh, you talked extensively about the lessons that you learned in uh, in your carpet cleaning business, but those things can be applied just about to any business. And I, I you know, I, I see your shirt; it says Genius Network, and I'm I'm familiar with that. But I want to, uh, I want you to tell us about your uh, mastermind group, uh, Genius Network, because your stated goal, if I remember correctly, is to build a better entrepreneur. And yeah. so um, uh, tell us about that, you know, because there's a lot of viewers uh, that have their own businesses, and I'm, I'm sure that they would like to hear about that. Yeah. So so let's go back to the term entrepreneur. You know, so one of the first recorded uses of the word entrepreneur was in 1804 by a French guy named John Baptiste Say. And he defined an entrepreneur as an individual that took resources from a lower level of uh, yield to a higher level, to from a lower level of productivity to a higher level of productivity. So if you go back to the actual definition of entrepreneur uh, today with social media and everything, there's a lot of people that fetishize the term entrepreneur, hustle, go and start a business. And, you know, uh, I went to dinner last night with my buddy, uh, Damon John, he's, you know, on Shark Tank, right? And so I um, shot a bunch of videos with Damon, I'm going to post on Instagram today. And he will too. And, you know, so there's all, it's now become entertainment for people to uh, voyeuristically look at, you know, entrepreneurs and people that are building businesses. Everyone's not built to be an entrepreneur. Although I think everyone can be more entrepreneurial. Like I have my assistant Eunice who has been with me for 28 years. I mean, she is an angel and she helps, she's brought in millions of dollars into my company and she does not even consider herself a salesperson. I mean, it doesn't even compute that way. Um, but she's done a lot of selling because when people talk to her, she knows we help people. She cares about them. She will not sell somebody something that she doesn't think is a right fit for them and a right fit for us. So she's very good at simply just listening to what people want. And if we have something that will help them guiding them to it, you know, cause people don't buy from you because they understand what you do. People buy from you because they feel understood. So with genius network, uh, everyone I think would be well served to either join or even though I have a company called genius network, I look at it as something that is available. If you put forth the effort to do it, uh, a, a genius network is a group of people that have skills and capabilities in a particular area and they collaborate together. Like I had a, uh, a person who I know from the marketing world sent me happens at my uh, you know phone number. And I met this person, um, I don't know, a few years ago and saw him at a wedding for a dear friend of mine. Uh, I don't know, it's probably this about four months ago. And this person said, Oh, you know, I talked to this, one individual, another friend of ours that said, you know, I got this event coming up and I need to, to put about another hundred people in seats. And I was wondering if we could collaborate and do something, uh, you know, together. And I could offer tickets to your genius network members and, uh, you know, we'll let them come. And then, and then he goes through all of the different things that are going to be sold, uh, at his event to people. And would you be interested in doing this? And, uh, and I left a three minute message, audio message back to him saying, Hey, great to hear from you. Hope you're doing well. Not very nice. Very courteous. I said, you said collaborate together. Uh, what you left me a message on has nothing to do with collaboration. The word collaboration means to produce or create something together. What you're suggesting to me is, can I pitch your stuff? 
And I don't do affiliate stuff except in very rare circumstances where I'm already working with the person. It's my own business. I'm certainly not going to promote an event that I can't attend. And your event happens to fall on the dates of one of my, my meetings. Secondly, I would never even consider doing something like this with someone who's not been in my group for at least three years because uh, I don't do stuff like that. I don't just, and, and I said, too many people are. Uh, throwing around the word collaboration these days uh, when it's just a sales pitch. They're just trying to pitch each other stuff. And I have no problem with doing that, but let's call it what it is. It's not a collaboration. And so, uh, so Genius Network is to build a better entrepreneur is help achievement focus badasses, you know, First off, someone has to make at least a million dollars a year in order to join my group. Secondly, we look at how they conduct business, who, what their reputation is. We have an application process, and it's a connection network. We used to it used to be a mastermind. It actually evolved into a connection network. We do masterminding in it, but I don't even refer to it per se as just a mastermind anymore. It's a connection network, and my goal is to bring and attract. Uh, industry transformers, people that are the best in the world or one of the best in the world at what they do and help them become a better entrepreneur. And the way we do that is we focus on health first, the mental and physical health. As you know, there's a, 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 a quote we say all the time. It's a proverb. Uh, he or she who has their health has a thousand dreams. He or she who does not have their health has only one. You know, if you're laid up in a hospital bed, you don't have goals and aspirations. You're going to win, you know, a competition. You're going to build a business. You, you just don't want to die. You just want to be able to maybe walk again or, you know, have your digestive system, system work or not be littered with cancer or whatever the condition happens to be. And so mental and physical health is the most important. Then there's wealth, not just making money, but managing it, which are two different skill sets. And the third is uh, what I I call elf uh, set up a business as much as you can it's easy lucrative and fun versus a half business which is hard annoying lame and frustrating so those are the overarching themes but honestly that's just sort of marketing speak the, right. the real thing is i sell people what they want and, and do my best to give them what they need so they think they're going to show up and learn how to make more money which they will or they're going to get better clients or they're going to meet cool people which all that stuff happens uh, but ultimately we want them to meet themselves we want them to actually deeper connect with them and so my goal is to uh, just help the givers of the world uh, be better more boundaried, more protected givers. Because if you are a giver, and look, for the time that I've known you, Lee, you've always been a giver. I mean, you're, you're Thank a you, generous, Joe. I appreciate that. caring person, always trying to help people, right? And so, and, and when you're, when you operate that way, you get taken advantage of. It's not a matter of if, it, it, it's just when, and it will happen. And it will happen a lot throughout your life. And what happens though, when you come across scoundrels or you come across people that take advantage, for one, you have to look at, how am I attracting it? How, how did this happen? Uh, everybody thinks they're right. So it takes a lot of awareness, you know, to think you're wrong. I mean, I've had to make many amends in my life. You know, when I was an active addict, you know, I was reacting to everything. I wasn't responding to anything. So you learn how to respond, not react, which is responding with ability, responsibility is what responsibility is. And so, you know, what, what I try to look at genius network as is like, okay, how, who has skills and capabilities, a sounding board, and how can I be the best giver and protect myself from narcissists, sociopaths, and psychopaths? Because they are walking the planet, and they will take advantage. That's, and, and that's, a, that's uh, an you, unruly you, group, Joe. What's that? That's an unruly group. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So, so my group yeah. is, I think, the best that I've been able to curate of achievement-focused givers that truly are genuine and generous, but I try to surround my people. Uh, I mean, my own people and myself with that all the time. I put everyone that I come into contact with once I start to get to know them through the L filter. One of the chapters in my book is, you know, be the type of person you'd like to answer the phone for. And I'll tell people, and I'll suggest it to everyone that's listening to us right now. If you are uh, communicating with people via text, social media, on the phone. Most people don't even use their phones as phones anymore, but they connect. The next five to 10 messages you get today, tomorrow, this week, however they come in, do a gut check. When someone sends you a message or calls you, do you feel woo, like you're excited or do you feel ah, you know, woo and ah. I, I, I write about this in the book. We, everyone wants more woo and less ah. 
And so what do you feel when you see the message? You're like, oh, shit, you know, this person's calling <laughs> or are you feeling like I'm really excited to talk to this person? Because if we have 10 people connect with us, some you're going to get back to right away with a level of enthusiasm and others, you have a bit of dread. Yeah, so, 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 some people can be real uh, energy drains. You know, Joe, I'm going to use this uh, 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 just as a uh, segue I want to tell you guys about this. This is Joe's new book, What's in It for Them. I've got my own copy right here. I got it on Amazon.com, uh, but you can get it at What's in It for Them.com also. Joe, you told me earlier that this is number four on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. Congratulations. It's a heck of an accomplishment. And it, it's Thank a you. really interesting title uh, to me because, you know, most people ask, What's in it for me? And you're asking, What's in it for them? So can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think the, 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 the question I've gotten over the years is how do you meet all these people? Like some people think that just because, you know, famous people or you've met wealthy people or whatever, that that is, you know, people often say it's not what you know, it's who you know. And certainly uh, the who's can open up doors for you. People uh, link themselves to credibility. Uh, people often do weird trickery things like they'll take pictures with famous people, they'll post them, they'll say nice things about the person while they simultaneously plug themselves, which I call that uh, give credit to credentialize, where you give credit to someone else to credentialize yourself. And it's it's really kind of funny because there's a big difference between you know knowing a famous person and snapping a picture with them versus having a, an actual relationship with the person where they're like your buddy, right? And so what's in it for them is the question I ask myself all the time, because frankly, no one gives a shit about you or they give a shit about me. Uh, and I'm saying that for effect, because I actually, there's a lot of people that care about others and that they don't even know. And those are the people I love the most. And I really work to be that sort of way. I mean, I gauge, you know, who are my close inner circle friends based on how they treat, uh, how are people that are more powerful treat people that are less powerful than them you want to size up a person go to lunch or dinner bro with someone that you yeah let, let me, I, I think i know where you're going with this you, you are you saying go go to lunch or dinner with them and see how they treat the wait staff right exactly man what am, one you. of my biggest pet peeves and i'll tell you how many deals i've walked away from you know when i've, I've uh, taken a prospective uh, business partner to lunch only to see them talk down to wait staff I'm not having any of that. Yep. And it's, it's, and as you know, it's a really good thing to do. It can save you a lot of misery in the future. Cause if, you know, anyone can be nice to you if they want something, right? We all want something. I mean, everybody wants something. There's not a single person listening to this that doesn't want something. Uh, if someone buys any of your products, your services that you've sold for years, they want something. They want to get healthier. They want to grow muscle. They want, you know, whatever they want. Uh, you know, later today, we're going to want to eat lunch or dinner, right? So we all want something. With everyone we interact with, we want something. There's nothing wrong with wanting something. What I say, though, is make sure that your give is equal to or greater than your want. Absolutely. The people that we actually like in life are the people that, like, going back to the phone example. If someone calls you up and you're like, oh, man, it's usually because that person wants more than they're giving. And now I'll, I'll, I often caution people, if you owe somebody money and they're calling you up, they're not the asshole. You have to look at yourself and say, well, you know, I owe this person something. I am not doing a good job of either keeping them in touch or I need to pay them or I need to have a conversation with them and not leave it up to them. And that's, you know, one of the dangers is people think other people are annoying when in reality, they're the instigator of the annoying. So we have to really look at ourselves. But what's in it for them is, I mean, it is a great question to, you want something from somebody? Identify what's their pain or their suffering. What What is the bad news that's going on in their life that you could help ease or ultimately eliminate in some cases? If, if you're, you know, when it comes to making money, uh, my buddy, Dan Solomon, who's the founder of a company called Strategic Coach, we, we've been doing a podcast together since 2012. And um, I've been in a client of his since 1997. He's been in Genius Network since 2010. And he says, other people's bad news is your good news. And it is a great way to look at stuff. And it's oftentimes weird for people to hear this. And so I want to give it some context. And as it relates to what's in it for them is 
If you think about most of the money that is made in the world, it's transforming other people's bad news into good news. Uh, it, if you're hungry, bad news. But if there's a restaurant or a grocery store or a place to get food, that's good news. If you break your leg, that sucks. That's bad news. If you can go to a doctor that can help you with that, that's good news. If you're bored or you want to learn something, you know, you can listen to a podcast. That's good news. You can go to a movie if you're, you know, th that's good news. So humans have all kinds of things from incredibly bad, oftentimes destructive, bad news to just simple things where they just want to feel better. They want to look better. They want, you know, whatever. So most money in commerce is transforming other people's bad news into good news. Uh, not always, but a lot of it. And so that's why the first chapter of what's in it for them is be a pain detective because pain and suffering are the signals that if you can help remove it or alleviate it, you will not only have the opportunity to build rapport with people because how much of our deeper, the real depth of relationships are not the friends that you have when things are going well. When things are going well, you're a big deal, whatever it is, you're surrounded by people that want to get a little bit of that. It's when things are going real shitty where you really know who your friends are, if you have a, you know, a, a bad breakup or something. And so my whole thing is like, you know, let's talk about Sandra Day O'Connor. Are you familiar with Sandra Day O'Connor, the first uh, Supreme Court justice in, in the United States? Yes. So, yes. so she, she recently uh, died. And Sandra, I interviewed her in 2013 at the Genius Network headquarters. Uh, her team asked me to do an interview with her uh, for something she was, uh, you know, had created civics.org. And, you know, I'm like, I'm going to interview Sandra Day O'Connor. And a couple of weeks before the interview, I mean, Secret Service, I mean, everything. My office building was just scooped for, you know, make sure it's protected and all that. And then the day of, I mean, you think a president was showing up. I mean, just a, a parade of people uh, sniffing bomb dogs. I mean, you know, the, like uh, she's treated like royalty. And so we did an interview. She was awesome. She was great. And then I met with her after that. We, you know, we had become very friendly with each other. She was very cool. And then fast forward a few years later, I have a friend named Dr. Janice Dorn, who was one of my uh, best friends. And she was a double PhD doctor with a, a degree in addictive medicine who had been a recovering addict herself. It almost died. It had gotten to a point where she uh, was literally gotten so weak from her addiction. She was calling in meds to be delivered to her home uh, under the names of patients that had died. That's how bad her addiction had gotten. Yes. And she's having it delivered. And she uh, weighed 87 pounds. Wow. That's how weak and frail. And she'd fallen over in her bathroom cracked her jaw on the bathroom counter, laid on the bathroom floor for a week. And wow. the only thing that kept her alive is she managed to turn the water on, plug up a sink, and it was dripping over the, the, the sink onto the floor. And she was drinking water off the floor until a house cleaner found her a week later. And so like this incredible woman, and then she did five months of, of rehab and uh, for, for physicians and then became just a coach to people. And she was coaching me uh, in a big part of my life when I was going through some, you know, incredible struggles. And then fast forward, you know, many years later, uh, I become the primary caretaker for her when she was, uh, you know, dying of cancer and she was in a hospice center, me and one of her other friends named Lisa. And so she was at an assisted living home when, uh, before Janice had gotten cancer, put her husband in this assisted living home. And then we, you know, I come up with this idea um, to help people that, you know, we have, we don't have a, a, a resource problem in the world. We have a distribution problem. There's plenty of food. There's plenty of water. There's plenty of everything. What, what we have though is a distribution problem uh, with governments and tyrants that try to hoard it. I mean, that's the, mm. I won't go into the complications of that, but one of the greatest resources we have is humans, love and care and compassion. And there's many people that are sitting in assisted living homes that they've lost their loved ones and they're struggling. And when I went to this home originally with Janice, when she put her husband, I saw a lot of lonely people and I was like, okay, you know, how do we bring resources and, and even volunteers? And so that was the first insight I got. And then a couple of years later, when Janice had died, I brought people back to that assisted living home uh, before her memorial. 
and didn't tell them what we were going to do. But we had 60 people that showed up at this assisted living home. And I said, we're just going to hang out with the people here. This was inspired by Janice. Janice would be so happy today before her memorial if all of us just hung out with the people here and just talked with them and did stuff. And so I was going to go up to the third floor of this this, um, assisted living home. And the second floor door opened and I got out. And I, you know, thought it was the third floor. Then the door closed behind me and you couldn't get out without security because it was the dementia and the Alzheimer's ward and people that were, you know, that that could not leave that, that floor. And I was like looking around. No one was around. I was with a couple of other people and I walk and then I see a woman in a wheelchair and I look and it's Sandra Day O'Connor. And I'm like, Sandra? She's like, Joe? I'm like, how are you? She's like, it like immediately remember me, of course. And then I spent two hours playing cards with her and a couple of the people wow. I was with, including my friend who's a Genius Network member named Dr. Sam Karachi, who's a, who's a psychiatrist, amazing guy. And we spent there a couple hours. But why am I bringing that up? So to contrast that with one of the most world famous people protected, and then here she is in an assisted living home, all of the fame, all of the notoriety, all of the accomplishments, all the achievements, there will be a point in time with all that shit doesn't matter. It just disappears. And so if you spend your life pursuing status, uh, you're probably going to be unhappy. If you spend your life pursuing growth, you're not only going to be more impactful, that's where the real deep connection was. So what's in it for them? Like, it's not just the title. It's, it's not just a question that's good to ask yourself. It's not just a methodology of connecting with people. Cause the, the real trick behind that book is I give people a lot of capabilities on how to connect with uh, others. Every chapter ends with what I call dominoes, how to be a domino. It gives people pretty doable exercises on how to develop your, your capabilities with connection. But it's really a book on character because there's a lot of people in the world that have great capabilities with selling and marketing and fitness and business and music and art and you name the talent. But the character is what's the most important. Doing things right versus doing the right things are two different complete skills. And so what I hope is that when people read what's in it for them, they not only benefit from it and become more caring and more compassionate with the people that deserve it, but also put up boundaries to the takers of the world so that they can protect themselves from getting screwed by people that are intentionally and purposely don't give a shit about you. They care about themselves. And so to be able to not just notice the red flags, but notice the yellow flags. So I do my best to do all that. But ultimately, I want them to look at their own character and say, you know, am I operating? Am I the type of person people would want to answer the phone for? And how do I raise children in that way? How, how do I become that sort of encouraging uh, influence? How do I protect myself from the kryptonite of bullshit um, and not be that way to other people? And if they do, they'll make more money. I think they'll have a happier life. I think they'll, they'll be less half hard, annoying, lame and frustrating people in their lives and more easy, lucrative, and fun people. Brother, um, this is so. this is this is so good. Joe, you're you're such a compassionate person and it really it just it it comes through. You know, uh and, and I, so I want to talk about one of your great missions in life. You you touched on it, but I want to go a little bit deeper. You know, but I'm I'm gonna segue into that by uh telling you a little bit about my past. As you know, uh as a Hall of Fame bodybuilder in my former life, I shared the stage uh, the Mr. Olympia with some of the greatest bodybuilders in history. And, yeah. you know, Joe, I can tell you, bodybuilding is a psychologically addicting sport. Okay. Mm-hmm. But through the years, I've also seen some athletes struggle with other addictions, you know, yeah. recreational drug use and such. And I know that you, one of your great missions, uh, besides working with entrepreneurs, is helping people with addiction recovery through your addiction platforms. And if you don't mind, I'm going to mention those uh, artists uh, for addicts. And the Genius Recovery Foundation. Uh, And I know that your mission with the Genius Recovery Foundation, and I quote, uh, is to change the global conversation of how people view and treat addicts with compassion instead of judgment and to find the best forms of treatment that have efficacy and share those with the world. Can you tell us a little bit about your mission? Yeah, so my my mission is is really the word is connection because there's a line where the opposite of uh, addiction is connection, and so addiction is a connection disorder. And the more the world uh, is disconnected, the more there's going to be addiction. And so 
Uh, I recently interviewed uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. And he mentioned, and, and the reason I interviewed uh, RFK is because he's been in recovery for over 40 years. Uh, well, now 40 years. He's been, it's exactly 40 years this year. And he goes to nine 12 step meetings a week uh, in spite of how busy he is, which is pretty crazy. So there's no, you know, and this is not a political thing. I, you know, even when I interviewed him, I was not sure that I would vote for him or not. I wanted to learn more about who he is. And now I've actually become friends with him. And I find him to be quite a fascinating, uh, really caring guy. And you become that way when you are helping other people. And so with recovery, I often get a lot of um, compliments and I appreciate them and I do my best to take them in and people will you know, say nice things about me with what I'm doing. And I also want to remind people, it's not because I'm some philanthropic angel here. This stuff really helps me with my own recovery. I mean, it's, it's a, is is counterintuitive as it seems. If you think your life sucks or you think your life is shitty, uh, go be of service to someone whose life sucks more than yours does. Uh, right. You know, if, you, if you're depressed, go find someone who's depressed also and talk with them. And, and oftentimes if they're dying and you can't help them get better, they're literally in a really broken state. Sometimes the, the only thing you could offer them is your presence. And when you can offer your presence to others, it makes you more present. And that's ultimately where I think we, we feel the best. So my goal with uh, Genius Recovery is to first change the global conversation about how people view and treat addicts because you cannot punish pain out of people. Uh, even if they've done bad stuff, it doesn't mean that they're inherently bad. Uh, it, it, and believe me, I have to question some people in the world. I mean, like when you look at what you think is truly evil and you see people that are killing or responsible for leading people into destruction, you know, the start of wars. I mean, there's a lot of horrendous things that people do, especially when it, you know, gets to the levels of incomprehensible things that I can't even fathom, such as torture and all the other stuff. In spite of that, though, there's a lot of beauty in the world and there's a lot of caring. And the way to counteract all of that is to, you know, build as much connection within yourself uh, for 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 what you you can and cannot do. I mean, I uh, so so going back to changing the global conversation, if we don't talk about it differently, we start viewing people as moral degenerates. And, you know, I have a friend named Andre Norman who's been working with me in Genius Recovery and in Genius Network for uh, five years now, over five years. And he spent 14 years in maximum security prison. Uh, he wrote a book called Ambassador of Hope. Uh, I just made him my chief of staff. And this is a test for us to see how this works out. Because he's like, you know, I used to, he was the number three gang leader in prison. Uh, he was in prison for uh, armed robbery and then uh, once in prison, two counts of attempted murder. And when I asked him, I said, you got two counts of attempted murder. What exactly did you do? He goes, well, I stabbed one guy 11 times. And I'm like, you stabbed the person 11 times and didn't kill him. He's like, well, I was good at stabbing, but not at killing. And I'm like, okay. And so he gets out, you know, 14 years after being in prison and uh, ends up going to Harvard, uh, becomes part of the social justice program. Now he's one of the highest rated speakers at YPO. And this guy's- Isn't that angel. amazing? Yeah, and, and we we've I know we've saved lives because you know, one of the things that we make available in, uh, to Genius Network members is either to themselves or to their family members or someone that's close to them. If there's anyone literally going off the rails, you know, Andre's like, don't send me to a picnic. I mean, send me to shit that's chaos. He goes, I you know, I'm, I manage psychopaths and murderers. I mean, I you know, I don't need like soft stuff. So he'll be boots on the ground helping people. We've done interventions, all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, the reason I bring him up is that last week, uh, five days ago, we went to the only woman's prison in Arizona, Perryville, and uh, I'd never gone and spoken at a woman's prison before. And he went there a few months ago because he had shot a video that was on some social media that said, if you want me to come to your prison, uh, you know, contact your caseworker. And um, I'll come. And he is in charge of currently 650,000 tablets in um, prison. There's 2.2 million people incarcerated in the United States right now. We're the highest incarcerating country of the world. And 40% um, of people that are in prison or incarcerated committed a violent crime. But 60% of the people have not. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of people that are arrested or thrown in jail, drugs or alcohol are involved. So we are putting a lot of people with addictions in jail and in prison. 
Uh, some of it is, you know, what else do you do if they committed a violent crime and they're danger to society? That's one thing. And I'm not, none of what I'm saying is an excuse to like let people off the hook. What I am saying though is addiction and pain and trauma leads to a lot of people doing a lot of crazy stuff. And I will bring this back to bodybuilding because there's a tremendous amount of addiction in that field, especially uh, food addiction, uh, sex addiction, gambling addiction. You know, I mean, you have a lot of people altering their hormones, uh, you know, men on testosterone that will do, I mean, the craving state. So there's sex addiction, but I'll come, I'll come back to that. So going back to this prison, you know, we speak to 50 women for almost three hours. And if you were to meet some of these women on the streets, you'd have no idea. Nice, caring, compassionate. Uh, there were a lot of them on meds. No one had an outbreak. No one was violent. And we talked to them in a very encouraging way. And I realized how none of it was filmed because we weren't allowed to take cameras in there this time. We're going to try to get it approved. So next time we go speak at not only that prison, but other ones, we can film this and then put it on all those prison tablets. Because right now we're getting genius recovery materials and genius network on entrepreneurship on the tablets. So the people that are incarcerated are actually consuming things that would be valuable and help them. So when they get out, or even if they never get out, they can be more productive while they're there. And just seeing these women that cannot see their kids, uh, some of them that you know are, are in there for a long time, they were so appreciative and they were so enthusiastic. But what it did for me though, and what working in, a, in recovery always does for me is it gives me a perspective. Whenever I think I don't have what I want, my life is not where I want it to be. One of the things I said to them is like, look, I can't even speak to, I'm not incarcerated. I've never been in jail for a long period of time. I mean, I got arrested early when I was a you know, kid and stuff, but I was like in and out of jail for doing stupid shit, right? And which I'll speak to, there's nothing that you could ask me that's off limits. I mean, if I can't answer something, I'll tell you that, but I'm pretty much an open book. And I said, you know, one thing I've often say to young people, I, and I said, if I was in a room of 800 young people at an uh, event I was speaking at, and, I, and all the people there wanted to make more money. And I, I said to the group, how many of you in the room are worth a million dollars? And a couple hands went up. And I said, anyone in the room worth five million? One hand went up in the back. Anyone in the room worth over 10 million? Same guy, hand in the back. I'm like, how many of you would like me to give you a million dollars? Everyone raises their hand. And I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. Anyone here pluck out an eyeball for a million dollars if I give you a million dollars? No one raises their hand. Uh huh. Five million? No one raises their hand. I'm like, no anyone lop off one of your legs for 50 million? No one would do it. I'm like, okay, think about this. You want to be a millionaire, but you actually have something that other people that don't have it would do anything to have. And you wouldn't give it up for a million dollars, but you don't think you're worth anything. But you got your ability to talk, the ability to breathe, the ability to hear. You got your feet, not all people, because there's one person or two people actually that were in wheelchairs. They couldn't walk. But I said, there's a lot of things that you have that are worth millions to other people. And we often take for granted and live in such a shitty mood. So when I do the recovery work and I help people, for one is change the global conversation about how you view and treat people. Just everyone's done awful shit at some point in time. Uh, and secondly, find the best forms of treatment that have efficacy and share it with the world. So I created an addiction platform to help people with addiction. And, and that's my goal because you can't punish pain out of people. Right now, we're trying to punitively treat Addiction, and that's it's not how it works. Addiction is a response to trauma or it's biochemical, serotonin, dopamine, hormones. And it is a great book if people want to understand it, written by my friend, Dr. Anna Lemke, who's an addiction doctor at Stanford. It's called Dopamine Nation. So if people want to understand the biochemical aspects of it, I wrote a book called The Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery. And I have another book called Understanding Addiction Recovery, which people can download for free that book at geniusrecovery.org. Uh, the point being, though, is that if you're a person listening to me and Lee right now and you're struggling with addiction, uh, a couple of things to know. You're as sick as your secrets. And if you are doing things in your life that you don't feel good about or you don't want to do and you don't have anyone to talk to about it, uh, it's going to eat you up. Uh, you know, it really well. It could be a food addiction. It could be a compulsivity. It could be whatever. And I, and I had sex addiction was my core addiction. Uh, I first medicated it with uh, cocaine, uh, speed, smoking pot. Before the age of 18, I'd probably taken LSD, I'm sure at least 75 times. 
Uh, I was getting high marijuana every day. I was drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes. There, my, in my worst state, when I was 18 years old, I freebased cocaine for, uh, which is smoking, you know, coke. Uh, for three and a half months straight, I weighed 105 pounds in my worst state. And when you're 18 years old and your your height is 5'10 and you're male and you weigh 105 10 pounds, wow. I mean, I look like a freaking concentration camp person. My average weight was around 120 pounds, which is still incredibly skinny. Uh, but there was one week where I didn't eat anything. And I had scraped together a couple of dollars because, uh, you know, we're, we're talking this is like, you know, back in 1986. And I went to McDonald's and I got chicken McNuggets and I go home and I'm like, I'm going to eat it. The first time I'd eaten any food uh, in close to a week. I mean, I just was sustaining drinking sodas and just fucking terrible food. And I get to the house and someone had scored some Coke and I put the chicken McNuggets on the counter because the Coke was more important to me, even though I was starving physically my brain was so wired and so addicted and so traumatized. Yeah. I literally did coke for a few hours. Six hours later, I go back to this freaking stiff chicken McNuggets and eat them. And I mean, I looked in the mirror and I, I just looked like a skeleton. My eyes were sunken in and it was freaking horrible. And if anyone would have looked at me then and then seen what I would, what I overcame, um, they would, you know, say, Oh, that, well, my God, you're, it's amazing. But uh, you know, I meet people, all the time, weekly, that have gone through shit that I cannot even fathom. And when you go to like a woman's prison or you meet some of these people, that's where I think I've developed, um, you know, empathy because there were a few people in my life that believed in me more than I believed in myself. And so to go back to, if you're struggling with addiction, uh, silent battles are the hardest battles to fight. Uh, you got to find a community. You you want to reach out. There's there's no shame in asking for help. There's no shame in walking into a 12-step group or a therapist's office or wherever you can find, uh, you know, connection and saying, I'm struggling. I need help. And the people, Lee, that have the hardest time with this are the ones that are rich and that are famous and that are smart and that are admired. Workaholism is the respectable addiction. I mean, we both know leaders, titans of industry that are admired in the world, made a lot of money, but their home lives are a total wreck. Yeah. They're having numerous affairs. They're doing drugs. They're addicted. You know, nootropics, Adderall. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, pre-pandemic, 20% of women in America were on some antidepressant. Yeah, it's I amazing. Mean, we are a country that there are 8 billion, you know, you do a Google search, it'll say somewhere between 2 to 4 billion. There's, there's estimates like as many as 8 billion prescriptions filled every year in a country that has, you know, 300 and what, 60 million people. Right. And so we are, you know, 90% of the global population consumes caffeine every day. And I'm not saying it depends on, you know, dosage, right. Of, of anything, the number one killer in America substances is sugar. First tobacco, second alcohol, third opiates, fourth. 50,000 Americans were killed in Vietnam. We have two Vietnams every year from opiates in America. That's how yeah, many people are dying. It's just, cra it's and just so crazy. Addiction is, um, I can explain the wars and the pandemic through the lens of addiction because anger and wars, people are culturally addicted to war. You see all these wars going on. It's crazy. You know, if people want an understanding of that, read the book Wars of Force that gives us meaning. Yeah, I there's, mean, there's, there's it's just, crazy. Um, it's uh, unfortunately part of humanity, you know, and it's, it's that dark side. And, you know, Joe, we need more uh, crusaders, you know, charging forth into the darkness with the light like you, my friend. You know, I, I could talk with you for hours and uh, I'm truly grateful that you joined us today. And it's so obvious that you have a heart for helping people and you're just doing a, a, an amazing job. Guys, be sure to get Joe's new book, What's in it for them on Amazon? You're going to be glad you did. Joe, where can our viewers find out more about you and your services and your programs? And what, where can they find you on social media? No, thank you. Let, let me mention you, everyone that buys that book, all the proceeds go to Genius Recovery. So anyone that oh, does good. get the book actually makes a contribution. Better. We're, we're going to, yeah. So they can find more. I think the best place is joesfreebook.com. joesfreebook.com gives out a book called Life Gives to the Giver. And then if you like that book, you can download it for free. 
If you want a uh, yeah, if you want a, a physical copy, I'll send it to you for free if you pay for shipping and handling. And I will not put you into a upsell funnel that forces you to buy a bunch <laughs> of other good stuff. So we, yeah, and that people can you know, I, I, Joe Polish is my Instagram. JoePolish.com is my website. Like nail polish or shoe polish, so it's easy to remember. And Lee, we're going to start a Genius Recovery podcast also, and I'm going to interview you for it. And I'm going to okay. go because you have a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom. And I want to share all the years I've, of experience that you have and the insight you have with all of my uh, listeners and viewers also on my YouTube channel and all that stuff too. So I would love uh, and to I really appreciate it. And, and I would to, love and to be there. On a positive note, because I know I said some dark stuff about addiction. The beauty is though, it's in the darkness that you actually find the light. And I really am a big believer in fun and comedy. And I write about that a lot in the book. And if people want to know what comedy is, um, pain plus time equals comedy, because there's some shit that you're going through in your life right now that you're like, oh my God, this sucks. But there will be a point in time if you if you respond to it, not react to it. If you really think it through, you will look back you will have overcome the adversity, the Amen. breakup that leaves you in a state of just such pain right now. You'll look back and be like, man, that was like the greatest thing. And it's hard to say, after going through recovery, I used to hear old timers say, I appreciate the gift of my addiction. And, and, and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? How is this a gift at all? And now I understand what that means because there's been enough time and enough work put behind it. So whatever you're going through right now that seems like a struggle, that is life's way of saying, you know, my friend Sean Stevenson on his deathbed, he was my best friend. That saying I heard a million times, but coming from him, he said, this is not happening to me. It's happening for me. And I, I heard that a million times before, but it really made sense when I heard it from a guy while he was about to pass away. And it was so dead. So life is incredible uh, yes, it it, is. as long as you, you live it. And I hope that uh, people can take that message in. And, and I appreciate the work you're doing, Lee. And I, Thank so, you. So great Thank you so much. Work. Brother, I love you for that positive message. I know that there's going to be lots of viewers that are going to really benefit from it. Guys, I, check out Joe Polish. He's amazing. Joe, I got to ask you, I've been, I've been speaking with you for all this time, and I've noticed that right over your left shoulder, there are three Campbell soup cans. Hey, dude, what's up with that? Are, are you hungry or are you like waiting to have some soup or what's up? I, I don't I don't remember the last time I've eaten Campbell soup, but here's it's kind of a marketing example. So the the two cans on the bottom, there is chicken noodle and tomato uh, are cost a dollar ninety nine at the store when I bought them. The can on top cost forty five hundred dollars because I bought it at an auction uh, because it is signed by Andy Warhol. <laughs> so I was at an auction a few years ago and bought this this can. And the point is, like how much you charge for something is based on your ability to sell it. Secondly, marketing is what does it actually mean? You know, like what gives the same thing more value? In this particular case, it's a signature, but everybody has the can of their stuff, their product or their service. So the question is, how do you make it more valuable? How do you present it? In a I'm going to remember that. And that's why I have it there to remember that. And it, see, the other ones you could argue to a hungry person would be made, made more valuable because this one has a hole in it and there's no right. more soup. It's just the empty can. Yeah. Those ones actually have edible food in them, but they only cost two bucks. And this is 4500 So, you know, that's, do a, that's a great lesson. Help us grow the Lee Lavrata show by sharing this podcast with just one other person. Would you do that now? And be sure to hit the subscribe button below. Leave your comments and feedback so that I'll know if I'm doing a good job or if you want to see something else. All right, you guys, stay motivated. Get up, look up, and God bless you. The Lee Labrada Show. Voices in my head imprison me. Wanna